Hey guys. Hi. Hey, Hi. it's better if I unmute myself. Yeah, Zoom is muted by default. In comparison this is exactly to... the right answer. Um, it should be muted by default. <clears throat> Hi, Radoslav. Hey. Hey, hi, guys. Yeah. Hi, Nikolai. Hi, Frederick. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> New persons join it. Hi, Denver. Hey. Yeah, I know. It's good to have this open. Would somebody be willing to share the, the issues board? See if I can find it. Can everyone see the issues board? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. OK. My experience has been that it's useful to work this backwards, <laughs> because you sometimes discover that um, things need to move from one column to the other. And if you start with the later columns and move towards the earlier columns, then you don't end up repeating yourself as much. Shall we start working backwards? We've got a bunch of stuff that sort of landed in the past week. Um, a bunch of PRs have gone in. We've seen some things like the add uh, set mac kernel stuff land, um, set kernel route kernel, um, et cetera. Anything anyone would like to particularly highlight in that, that grouping? <coughs> OK, shall we jump into the in progress? So create get Mac uh, network server chain element. I think this went in this morning. Is that correct, Denise? Uh, yes, it is merged. Excellent. Um, this was the, the the piece to make sure that we could go and fetch the um, the Mac address and populate the destination Mac when a request comes into a server. So that's very useful. Um, Andre, I know that you started poking at the create metrics network service yeah, element. Yeah, yeah, it's still in progress. Of, we arrived at an interesting discussion about exactly where in the API that should go, and I think you were queuing up some stuff to discuss in the community meeting. Yeah, at the moment I'm uh, experimenting with it. Still, uh, I think putting it into the pass uh, is not quite right uh, because amount of data could be quite huge. Uh, I want to have similar structure like path, but for the metrics. 
and just send it with a update uh, event, a separate map. Okay. Very similar to the connections, but with just with the matrix. And uh, right now adding the propagation and proper handling into the chain elements. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, interesting thing uh, is to limit uh, with the interval how often we could receive the metrics by the client. So client will be able to, I think, configure the interval for receiving the metrics. And if the chain is quite long, uh, every item will uh, send the metrics with the interval configured. So if it will be more often and uh, time mismatch on a different endpoints, uh, finally, it will not send more than just configured amount of uh, metrics. So one thing I had been thinking, <clears throat> and, and this may or may not be the right answer, um, was that because we are periodically refreshing the connections, so as to avoid timing them out, um, you know, effectively when I when I send the connection through the system, this ends up bumping the monitor along as it goes through. Yeah, uh, and something has changed. And so, if we attach them to the path segments in connection, then a client can basically pump for more metrics um, at at will, right? It can essentially say, "Look, you know, send the request through." The request comes back, it gets a metric, metrics on the request, the update, get, um, the monitor gets updated, etc. Yeah, um, uh, but passing all the connection with uh, all tokens back uh, more often could uh, lead us to a huge amount of data transferred. No, and that, that's definitely something we want to think about and consider. Now, the other thing yeah. I have to ask is sort of like, what, what are we likely to actually have in terms of metrics here, right? So, um, for example, um, I think because we're dealing with virtual wires that the meaningful metrics are probably going to be something like, you know, packets received, you know, basically packets received, packets transmitted, bytes received, bytes transmitted, and yep. drop are probably going to be the interesting ones to allow you to, to debug. So it's not a huge amount of data. Um, the overhead, frankly, of sending it back um, is, is a greater amount of data than the actual data itself. Because you're you're putting it with other, other information when you send it back. Yeah, but it, for all the chain, for example, if we have multi, like VPN, multi endpoint, yeah. on every. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I, I understand. It's definitely something worth looking at, and I'm glad you're thinking about it. So yeah. uh, I'm kind of excited to sort of sort this out um, and figure out what we want to do there. Anybody else have anything to say on this, or? <laughs> Cool. All right, so that's still in progress. Uh, migrating kernel forwarder to new style uh, cross connect network service stuff. Radoslav, um, I know you were looking at this, and so is Ryan Tidwell, who I don't think is here. How is that yeah. going? Um, yeah, I saw his uh, kind of initial work, and uh, actually, I'm really thankful for your feedback on improving that. I'm, yeah. I'm sure it's, it's, it was not the best, so. It, it, it's, there, there are two things happening here. One is, you know, like we're, we're, we're trying to maximize code recycling, which is generally a good thing. And then we're also sort of shifting the style with which we're doing a lot of these things. Um, so yeah, and, and, and trying to keep things very sharp and crisp and, and so forth. So, um, but yeah, it was good to see some, some forward motion on that. Cause I know that the SROV talking to, to Ryan and to Prem, and, and I don't remember I had this conversation with you as well. There, there's a certain amount of stuff uh, in terms of the kernel SDK that'll be re recyclable into the SRIO V piece. Because for example, the same piece that you use to set the IP addresses on a kernel interface that happens to be part of a V pair is going to be the same set of code that you probably are going to use for setting an interface on an SRIO V backed kernel interface. Yeah, indeed, and also the neighboring and everything else. Yeah, yeah I know, like like the the, the 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 neighbors, the routes, all that stuff. Right. Yeah, It'll, yeah. You'll be pulling that forward. So I think probably the faster we get that going in kernel forward, the better we're going to be. And the good news is it breaks into small pieces, so you can go work on individual small chunks of it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Cool. Awesome. Um, 
create authorization network service chain elements. I've seen some stuff go by from you on the cilia, but I'm not sure quite where we are with all the pieces. I know that, that Frederick had some, some comments and so how is this going? Where do we stand on this? Do we have Ilya this week or is he out? Uh, he worked today, but I have not see he connected. Okay, cool. So um, if somebody wants to sort of poke him over Slack or whatever, and we can loop back if he, he turns up. Yeah. Cool. Um, Wire guard remote mechanism support. Uh, Frederick um, and Artem, I think you guys have been kibitzing on this. Do you guys have things you'd like to say? Um, yes, I'm almost uh, finished with uh, WireGuard on kernel forwarder. And uh, we need to discuss with you about implementing WireGuard uh, into VPP if it's required. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really a question of what folks want to do. But I mean, it would be interesting to add it as a, as a thing to VPP as well. Um, yeah, we can make a plugin for VPP and mm -hmm. uh, use it just for net service mesh. Uh, maybe we can make a plugin for a VPP agent instead of VPP. Well, I think it ends up being sort of two steps. One is if you want to run the data path through VPP proper, VPP itself has plugins. And then you need to get the uh, stuff up into VPP agent so that we can actually conveniently poke yeah, it. Uh, as I know, VPP agent has some kernel stuff inside already and not using a VPP directly. So I think we could, if we have a kernel already, maybe we can reuse the same code, but from a VPP agent. I think though most of the stuff that they're doing there is in the service of being able to deal with the things that are plugging into VPP. So I don't know how thematically interesting that would be to them. So I, I think this is interesting though, it kind of sort of like breaks up the, the question. The first is sort of like, where do you want the data path passing through? And the work that I think your Artem is currently doing is getting WireCard working just on top of normal kernel data path. And then, I, you know, the, the question then becomes, you know, do you want to be able to run that data path through VPP? And, you know, if you do want to run the data path through VPP, you need a WireGuard plugin for VPP so yep. that you can actually handle that in cap. Um, yep. But that's something I, you know, I, I, do you have any comments on this, uh, Frederick? You've been very quiet, possibly muted. Definitely muted. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. So I was uh, trying to shuffle multiple things. So can you give me a little bit more context so I can respond properly? Yeah, so we were just sort of kibitzing a bit about the WireGuard stuff. And, and Artem had said that he's got it working through the kernel data path, which is awesome. And please note, um, you know, enough that you, you can work things through whatever data path makes sense for your port, or you don't have to work them through VPP. But the question of whether or not and how to work it through VPP had come up. And Artem had opined that if we wanted to, to have a WireGuard data path going through VPP, we would need to do a VPP plugin for WireGuard. Ah, I see. Yeah, so that's that's one possibility. Um, a, a second possibility is um, we could also uh, create something that uh, then interacts through something like Memif. And uh, that then separates it out from VPP. So anything that supports Memif can uh, can make use of the uh, of the uh, path without having to drag VPP in as well. Um, in terms of which path is more is more appropriate, um, I mean, I mm -hmm. it, I I'm personally okay with with either particular path, but. Uh, uh, you know, my my recommendation would be to take a look at the at the overall uh, uh, complexity of, of both of them. Like, I don't know how complex it is to set up a VPP. So, quick, quick, quick question: Is WireGuard running? Um, is WireGuard constructing the packets itself and using raw sockets to push them down to a kernel interface? Uh, could you repeat repeat the question? Is WireGuard constructing the packets itself and pushing them down to the kernel interface. I guess the, the, it's not clear to me, like in the, in the case of the kernel uh, data path for WireGuard, it's not clear to me how the mechanism of that works. 
Uh, yeah, it's like uh, we're got first uh, making handshake with the endpoint, and then it, it's uh, uh, encapsulate packets by itself. Uh, like, um, I think uh, VXLAN works almost the same, just without encryption, as I understand, it, and without handshake. Okay, yeah. so let, let's talk a little bit about sort of the life of a packet. So I'm an application, and I grab an interface that's that 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 I've got that I'm sending. I'm opening a, t a listening socket on. I'm listening for TCP. I presume that interface somehow hands off to WireGuard, so that WireGuard can do the NCAP. Uh, it it it's it is doing NCAP and then send this packet uh, using UDP. Okay. So yeah, you're right. You're right, uh, Frederick. It might be a better intermediate step to try and send that using Mamaya, um, because we can then reuse the stuff the WireGuard guys have got in terms of building the packet. Yeah, and to get the mechanics uh, a little bit more uh, tight in terms of how it works on the kernel side, so you end up with a um, uh, you end up with a particular uh, interface. So when you when you create a new WireGuard system, it create it tends to create a new interface within the network namespace that you're currently active in. And so when you send a packet that exits out of that interface, then the kernel mechanism will create, or the kernel module will create the uh, UDP packet, and then inject it back into the network namespace, which then leaves out of your. Uh, out of your main interface that uh, uh, that is, that's within the, that particular net, uh, network namespace, and so uh, so there there is so it definitely creates the it, it definitely creates the the packets. The, the one of the questions then becomes how do we uh, how do we capture the um, uh, the packet in that particular in that particular respect uh, or in in the longer my my hope is that we could use something like uh, uh, like Borington or or one of the other WireGuard um, uh, or one of the other WireGuard um, applications that exist and just tweak it so that we can um, uh, instead of using the kernel interface we we generate the packets using the using the mechanism of our choice. Okay, cool. So it sounds like there's a lot of interesting work going on here. I'm, I'm super interested to see where the first piece lands. Um, cool. Awesome. Um, all Can right. I suggest yes. something? Please. Would it, would it make sense if we have a um, dedicated wire guard for order? At least initially, I think that's probably a smart move. Does that make like, sense? This way, you can combine it with either VPP or with kernel. We just install both of them. And I know that today it's not with we, we are not the best at supporting uh, <laughs> most. But like, uh, if a, a client or a server uh, or a, uh, endpoint uh, suggests uh, or uh, like needs a WireGuard interface mechanism then the wireguard folder will be the only one supporting it so it will get automatically selected i think yeah so i mean i think that's probably a really it's definitely a good a smart way to start right because then you you just deal with the simplest route between a and wire between a and b to get to wireguard um and then once we've sort of got the simple thing working you can decide what makes sense because there's two sorts of pressures in the system in my mind the first is if you just go do a WireGuard forwarder, it's the simplest way to get something working with WireGuard. Um, and then the second piece is I think users are going to want to run as few forwarders they, as they can get away with to solve their problem. And so you want to be able to reduce the number of forwarders that they run. But I would say that the first pressure, being able to just get from A to WireGuard working, is the one that, that's strongest at this stage. And we can always come back and incorporate it into existing forwarders, um, particularly the way the SDK model is being being rolled out, where you've got small chunks of things. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I think that's actually a very interesting uh, point. Yeah, I've um, 
a couple other paths as well that I can that I can think of on this. But perhaps what I should do is I should stick uh, the variety of approaches I can think of on uh, in a Google document, so we don't need up the, all the time in this, <laughs> and we can uh, we can pass it around and, uh, and solicit feedback yeah, that, on, that's, on it. That's actually an excellent point because um, we've actually got. Um, we, we've only got 10 minutes left on this call, so we should probably get moving. Um, cool. So add NSM test suites to reduce cluster count on CI. Um, this was something, let's see. Do you want to say something about this, Denise? Oh, yes. Uh, this PR uh, will uh, reduce uh, CI time and uh, reduce uh, cluster count um, uh, it will uh, add possible to create test suits, uh, which will uh, reuse NSM and forwarder pods uh, in a couple of tests. And we will uh, save time uh, on deploying and uh, cleaning NSM and forwarder pods. Ah, uh, uh, I remember, yes. I remember well, now. It's about... Uh, uh, 15 uh, seconds per test. Which is several hundred tests is a big deal. Um, yeah, the um, I remember this now. Basically, right now, every time we run a test, we're standing up network service mesh and we're tearing down network service mesh. And with this, we would have suites where we would stand up network service mesh, we would run a bunch of tests on it, and then we would tear it down. Oh, is yes. Uh, yes. Uh, currently, uh, this. Uh issue is blocked. Uh, I just wait for a new release. <laughs> Andre, how's yeah. that going? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll try to do it uh, as soon as possible. Just okay. wanted to do some cleanups for cloud testing tool. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, OK, cool. Um, adding the SROV mechanism. This is stuff where we've already got um, a PR that started landing. Um, from uh, Zemek, where he's starting to bring the SRIOV kernel and user space mechanisms into API. Um, I know that we, we had sort of a, a really good back and forth conversation there, Nikolai. Um, where I left it, it looked like you might be okay, but it wasn't clear. Uh, yeah, okay. I will have to, to, to check again. Uh, that, that's what I, I wanted to add. Like, this is the very first PR, which actually we also had the very first heated discussion about <laughs> it. Um, I still somehow feel that SROV is not the right naming of the mechanisms there. Okay, no, no, that, that's that's a very valid thing, right? I, I I want to get that settled out. That's why I sort of turned back and said, okay, we, we've had conversations about some of the big issues you raised. Where where are you? Because I had lost track of the naming issue, even though I think I agree with you that it's probably a good one. Yeah. Um... Nothing. Uh, I haven't seen any further comments there. So okay. So we can we can we can take that conversation back to the PR. Um, so in, yeah. in general, I know Radoslav, you you've been looking at some of this as well, and, and Ryan and and sort of moving some of the pieces forward um, for this. Um, any any progress other than the stuff we discussed earlier on the kernel bits from you guys? Um, nothing on my side. I'm yeah. I don't have any remarks on that. Cool. Um, so we had a, a, a PR that came through from Peter um, on initialisms. And, and this basically came down to um, his suggestion that we, um, you know, that uh, he was suggesting that we, we basically alter a little bit in the API, how we're handling capitalizations for, um, you know, basically things that are initials, initialisms. So like we, the one he pointed to was we had net NS and he was suggesting capitalizing both the N and the S uh, as they span, span, stand for namespace. Um, so I would, I would suggest folks speak in on this. It's, it's an interesting conversation. We probably want to start out how we want to handle that. Um, and we've already talked about the metric stuff. So moving on to the to-dos, or is there anything in progress that didn't land here? Okay, so moving on to the to-dos, uh, example sort of test OPA use cases. This is stuff I think Ilya is working on. Frederick, is that correct? I believe so. Okay. Um, 
So the create the network service registry client to add the pod name, node name, and possibly cluster name labels to registration. This is actually a great starter issue um, because it, it doesn't actually, it, it's, it's not particularly hard, um, but it would involve writing a little um, chain element that we could stick in clients that would add these labels to them. So is anybody interested in picking this up and going and beating on this? Okay. We can uh, bring it up in the next meeting as well. Yep, agreed. This one also very similar and also a good first issue. Um, uh, create authorization monitor chain element. This is basically saying we should probably do authorization for monitoring, um, which is important. And then I realized that we don't currently have sort of the core elements for monitoring to let us chain them easily, um, which is probably something we're going to want. So that issue is there. Uh, porting the SRV6 mechanism. I know you finally landed the SRV6 stuff, Artem, in um, the, the, mo the mono repo. It would be good to eventually get those pieces ported over as chain elements in SDK VPP agent. Mm, okay. So, and then uh, package core adapters can't be used with package next. This was a really smart uh, catch, Denise. Um, I think that we've merged the solution to this. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is correct. Cool. So I'll go ahead and close that issue then. And then you also had brought up and we wanted to talk about how we're going to handle integration tests. Um, oh, I, I have closed this issue because uh, I think uh, repo pipelining will solve okay. this problem. Cool. I mean, you, you raised an important point. I wanted to make sure it didn't get lost. Cool. So anything else that we're missing on the board here? So um, one thing I do want to sort of be very, very clear about um, is that we, um, so we, we've, it turns out that GitHub has just added a new um, level of repo access that they're calling triage, which is lovely because it means that people can be added to the community who can go through and assign things to projects and assign themselves and others to bugs and that kind of stuff. Um, I think I think most or all of the folks on the call here who are actively working on stuff have been invited to join the Network Service Mesh Contributors team, which has those privileges across the repos. So if you have gotten such an invite and haven't responded, it would be good for you to respond. If you haven't um, gotten such an invite uh, and you're working on things, please let me know. I, I, I may have missed some folks. Um, but that way you can make sure, for example, that your stuff lands um, on the board rel in a relatively straightforward way. Because if you go, for example, to an issue, um, you can just click and add it to the issue PR tracking project for an issue or a PR. That way it all sort of bubbles up to visibility. Cool. Any other questions? It sounds like we're about to start the next meeting. All right, so we'll carry over and allow a few minutes for folks to join. Fantastic. See you. I will use the next five minutes to make coffee. <laughs>
for folks just joining the call, usually we start about five minutes after um, to give folks time to join. If you could please go and add yourself to the attendees list, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, <clears throat> A reminder, a, reminder, a reminder to everyone that um, this meeting is recorded um, every week and posted to YouTube. So um, do keep that in mind. Uh, be a little cautious with what you share, et cetera. And speaking of which, is someone willing to share the uh, weekly meeting notes? That would be super helpful. Yeah, we'll get started in another two to three minutes. Yeah, I always enjoy the uh, backdrop that uh, right when I see the giant NSM behind people, like uh, like yours, Ed. So, uh, for those of you who don't know how to do that, there's uh, in the Zoom desktop version, there's a uh, there's an option to set a backdrop, and you can load an image of your choice. And so, uh, feel free to do that for even if you don't choose not to use NSM, you can choose your own favorite backdrop as well. Okay, let's get started. So welcome to the next Network Service Mesh meeting. We hold this particular meeting every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. We also hold a, um, a um, Asia-friendly uh, meeting every other week. Uh, Nikolai, do we have one uh, this, uh, this week or, or is, it, uh, is it on next week? Unmute, unmute. Okay. Um, in my schedule, there's no one. Although, yeah, yeah, it's the first and third, so not, not, not this week. Next week. I'm sorry, not for the network stick for this for the NSM Asia friendly one. So that so that means we had one last week. So there must be one next week then. Yes, there, there is. Yes, of course, it's every every other week. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Sorry, I was looking at the. Yeah. Huh. Uh, my, my apologies. Yeah. So there, there, there is. There will be one at uh, next week, 
at mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe 3 a.m pacific time um we also participate in the cncf telecom user group the next one will be on february 3rd at 8 a.m pacific time there is also one on every which is every first monday every third monday there's also one at 3 a.m pacific time the zoom is linked from here uh the cncf sig network has been rebooted and we which also occurs on every first and third thursday of the month at 11 a.m pacific time so we also participate in the cncf sig network now the cncf sig network is uh, is a little bit interesting in this scenario uh because the technical oversight committee is starting to uh delegate the the analysis of projects and especially inbound projects into a sandbox to the uh, to the sig to the related sigs and so the sig network is one area where uh, it would be good to see a diversity of, of people and ideas so that we can get a maximum amount of, of input uh, that has not started yet but expect it to happen soon oh, um, actually Actually, last week, or actually the week before that, we reviewed two projects. There were two projects that were presented as a SIG network. That was the main topic there. Oh, uh, cool. Well, I stand corrected. I will go and find so, the recordings. Yeah. I mean, uh, the thing started to happen. And it's a really interesting introspection. It, I mean, at first it sounds like, okay, uh, NSM doesn't have anything to do with that, but I believe that we as a community are trying to address a more general networking problem and it's really interesting to be on top of what's actually being proposed, what's happening, what projects are you know, coming to CNCF. So I think it's a lot referent, uh, like a lot relevant to what we, what we are trying to do here. Cool. And so major events coming up. Um, in San Francisco at GoSF, I am going to be running a talk on Cloud Native Zero Trust. Uh, and the talk is going to be on how we can use uh, a variety of CNCF projects together, such as uh, Network Service Mesh and Spiffy, Spire, and Open Policy Agent, and a few others in order to, in order to achieve zero trust. And I'll also be talking about not only what works, but where the gaps are as well. So there's certainly some gaps that need to be filled. So come if you are in the San Francisco area in that time period, uh, please come and uh, and join me, and I will post more details as I as I get them. Can I suggest something? If if there is no recording, but I mean, if if there's recording, if there's no recording, if you cannot what whatever materials you have to the, our events page on the website because it sounds like a really, really interesting topic and um, yeah, sharing it is probably worth for, for us. Sure, I'll ask them if they're uh, recording it and if not, uh, maybe I can do something myself where I can, I can, re I can record my, my own voice and try to produce something on that, but we'll, we'll see. Worst, worst case scenario, I can always do something afterwards and, um, and stick, stick it on YouTube. So, okay. Um, cool. So we also, so this is this is also right before uh, KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe. Uh, so that will be from March third to April second, which will be in the RAI Amsterdam in the Netherlands. The schedule is uh, going to be announced very soon, and. If you'd like to see the list of collected submitted talks that we know of, Taylor has uh, compiled a list that you can go look at. And if your talk is not on that list, feel free to add it. We also have NSMCon, which will be co-located. We are accepting proposals to talk, and there is a sponsorship perspective that is currently open. So uh, if you'd like to talk or sponsor, um, please, please submit uh, uh, earlier rather than sooner is always better, but of course we won't penalize anyone for, for showing up later. Um, and with that, we, we also have a larger room. So remember, those of you who were at last year's room, the room, is, the room capacity is twice as big. So, and last year we had standing room only, so, uh, so that'll be 
be good. We on the KubeCon, uh, I know that there is at least one talk accepted. From what I know, I mean, from the the ones that we submitted. So uh, I know that we cannot talk about it yet, but um, yeah, there's at least one uh, submitted uh, and accepted, which is yeah, we, we we will have all kinds of. I, I think we can save the happy dances till after Wednesday, but uh, yeah. Wednesday is going out, and there's a lot of hope that that we will we will have things go quite well. Yeah, because I think that up till now we have at KubeCons we had only the maintainers tracks more or less, uh, and if we have one that is out of the maintainers track, it's uh, at least one, I hope, couple, then it will be great. But yeah. Cool. So we also have Open Networking and Edge Summit in North America. And so the CFP closes on February 3rd. And the schedule will be announced in, in early March. So um, there is KubeCon and Cloud Native Con China in Shanghai. That will occur in May, the call for paper closes in February, uh, February 21st. So please, uh, please make sure not to miss that if you are intending to to visit China. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have a small update of these both these these ones. So I'm planning on Open Networking Edge Summit to submit something, and I'm working with um, with Michael who presented his work uh, last week here uh, and also we are trying to figure out something with Taylor uh, and uh, for the KubeCon China on actually on, on our last Asian call uh, Jay mentioned that uh, he's going to submit a talk about NSM I don't know if we'll be able to do any maintainers there but uh, there's still like a month I don't know who knows maybe but at least one talk about NSM will be submitted from the local uh, community there so that's it. Nice. So I'll I'll also put it. I'll also put something forward as well. Uh, Los Angeles is is real close to where I'm at, so it's pretty easy for me to get to. Um, we have Open Networking and Edge Summit in Europe, which is going to occur in Antwerp. Uh, I believe in the same location as last year. The call for papers closes or call for proposals closes on June seventh, and the notifications occur in July, uh, July 9th. Uh, we finally have KubeCon and Cloud Native Con Boston, uh, which the CFP will open on April twenty second, and they close in June. Um, so even though it's a long way away. Uh, start thinking about what type of things you would like to see because when you are in um, when you're in KubeCon EU it's a great opportunity to meet people who you can potentially present with and uh, with that we have a couple announcements we have a new NSM projects page so if you notice this particular project is an organizational level project not a uh, not a project level project. That was a bit weird saying. Uh, and so we are going to keep track of issue and PR. We had a, uh, we had a public call uh, just before this one. So 30 minutes before this call, every Tuesday, we are running the issue and PR tracking call. So if you would like to join in on helping us with uh, issues or PRs, uh, this is a great place to work out what's happening and to initiate contact for help. One of the things that we're going to try to avoid, and we can do a better job of this uh, uh, based on today, is to is to not try to spend time solving or fixing issues on here. So it's okay to ask for like a couple, a little bit of help, but there's a lot of information that needs to get packed into 30 minutes. It is specifically designed like this so that uh, we don't jump into the weeds when we're when we're talking about it. So we also with that, do we have Lucina on the call? Uh, 
Great. I'll be doing the social media updates from now on when I'm available to make these calls. Oh, cool. Uh, welcome. And please, uh, please introduce yourself for, uh, for the community. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Ashley. I am working with Volk Cooperative and have been helping out with a bunch of social media for Network Service Mesh. So Thank some... you so much for that, by the way. You are welcome. No problem. Glad to help where I can. So as far as some updates go, um, as far as the Twitter account, we have gained 10 followers since last week. Um, we are now sitting at 665 followers. We've followed an additional two accounts. And as far as tweets and retweets for the last week, about 19 of those have gone out. Included in these tweets, a lot of them have been NSMCon related. So reminding people and encouraging people to register, reminding them of the CFP deadline coming up, as well as trying to get the word out there for uh, sponsorships. There have been some retweets from CNCF account, just further promoting KubeCon um, as well as Day Zero events and promoting the diversity scholarship applications. And then there have been a couple of blogs that have been retweeted from VMware as well as Network Simulations with Network Service Mesh, a really nice write up over there. And then the video recaps from last week's meetings. So those are all on Twitter and most of these are up on LinkedIn as well. And LinkedIn in the last week, we've gained an additional 10 followers. So it's been really good to see that we are consistently increasing the following across the board in Twitter as well as LinkedIn and hoping for further engagement as um, we start promoting um, more of the events coming up at NSMCon, as well as any events that are accepted for KubeCon. And um, yeah, hopefully we will just continue to see that following and engagement continue onwards and upwards. So if there are any other announcements that need to be made, then please feel free to reach out to me and I will continue, um, yeah, like I say, promoting NSMCon and um, any podcasts that are to come up as well as any future events. Thank you very much for the, um, for the update. And also thank you very much for the help. Like it, um, it this type of stuff helps us tremendously. Sure thing. Cool. With that, uh, we have a very important topic on the agenda, which is our new repo pipelining. So, Ed, you have the floor. Yeah, let me go ahead and start talking through that a little bit. Um, so, uh, we, we started, as you, some of you have probably known, breaking some things out of the mono repo. So, let, let's actually go to slide. Next slide. So as we've grown with our Uno repo, the network service mesh, network service mesh, it's become very large and complex. And um, it, it's not entirely obvious off the bat because if you just go through and you count the lines of code in the system, it's actually not that large. But thematically, it's doing a lot of different things and that makes it sort of unwieldy. Um, and the CI for the Uno repo is very, very long. Um, so it encourages people to make larger changes at once because it takes so long to transit the CI. Uh, it overall discourages contribution because it means you can come and bring a patch and discover that, you know, you've got these long CI cycles and something goes bump in the night for reasons you don't quite understand. Um, and it slows development velocity in general. And so these, these are sort of problematic. And so if you look at the current state, we've already started a bit of an experiment. So in the mono repo, we've got a CI time on the order of about an hour and 20 minutes in network service mesh mono repo. And we've done some initial pipelining. Um, and what this means basically is we've got an API repo where we've relocated the API. Um, we've got an SDK repo, which has platform independent SDK bits, right? So there are no dependencies there that are specific to BPP agent um, or weird kernel dependencies. It's just sort of munging things because it turns out there's a lot of munging things that we need to legitimately do. And if you look, the CI time for each of these repos when you push a patch is order of about a minute and 20 seconds. Some of them are a little bit faster, um, you know, closer to a minute, but generally that range. Um, the other thing that we've managed to set up is 
we've set up, and this has all been done with GitHub Actions. We've set up some GitHub Actions so that if a patch is merged into, say, API, um, automatically that gets pushed as a PR to SDK. So about 30 seconds after something merges to API, a PR pushing the API change forward to SDK comes in. And you can go take a look, and if it passes, you can just merge it. And in fact, once we gain some comfort, we could even set up a GitHub action to auto merge those uh, if they pass CI, right? Um, although that, that's not quite what we're doing yet. And then when you merge something to SDK, including the updates from API, um, SDK about 30 seconds later goes and automatically pushes PRs downstream to SDK VPP agent and SDK kernel. Um, and so you're just adding up the CI plus transit times here. You're looking at about a five minute, 30 second max through the system, not counting the um, any review time. And so if we were to get to the point where we were comfortable merging sort of clean updates from downstream, from upstream that pass CI, um, the transit time through this whole chain from an HVI change that ends up being harmless um, could be as little as five minutes, 30 seconds. And so this is what we've tried so far in terms of pipelining. I have quick questions. Oh, please, questions are good. Questions are good. So is this 30 seconds the time for the actions to actually get triggered? Or is uh, no, it's, it's the time until the PR, uh, basically for the actions to come up, do their thing, and finish. OK. So basically, when, when something is merged to API, that merge causes a GitHub action to run. That GitHub action has to go pull the code for SDK, update its dependencies, and push the PR. Uh -huh. And that takes okay. about 30 seconds. OK. Uh, and then the other thing, uh, because as you said today, this would be more or less manual process. So like API creates a well, we PI. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know that because I have picked up the slides, <laughs> as people uh -huh. can can imagine. But um, I know that that probably you're going to talk next about these things. But um, if we do this automatically, uh, then uh, how are we going to track back like um, for example if something like there's an API change then this automatically goes to SDK then this automatically goes to SDK VPP agent but then something breaks then how do you revert back all the previous you know yeah and, and so like the, and the something breaks there's an interesting question about what to do when something breaks right because there are a yeah. couple of different things that can be true so for example um, let's say that you make an API change, it floats to SDK, that goes well, it bumps up to SDK VPP agent. We, and, and so you get a PR there that has broken CI, right? Yeah. So you go look at the PR. It could be a couple of things, right? One of the things that it could be is that the, the API change actually requires you to do some work in SDK VPP agent. It's not actually a breakage in the sense that, yeah. you know, that, that you got to go fix API. It's something you got to go fix SDK VPP yeah. agent. This in is which a case, yeah. good one. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the happy case, right? Yeah. In, in which case you would you would go and fix that. Um, but the real question is, is how do you get the backtracing? And one of the things I've been poking at is how to improve the backtracing. Um, because what I'd like to do for improving the backtracing is basically to um, uh, improve the commit messages and the PR messages as things float through the system to make it easier to backtrace. Right now, they just tell you that it's one of the automated updates and what repo it came from. Um, I'd like to be able to have it actually indicate, okay, it came from this commit coming into the repo and here's the link to the PR for that commit, um, that kind of thing. So you could sort of chase it back quickly when you see a fail. But that's a little bit of work I still need to do. I kind of, have, I kind of know how to do it. It involves a certain amount of parsing of environment variables because all the necessary information is there in the GitHub action, but not quite in the form you would want to go sticking your PR. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's just go through this and probably yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm sure as we get experience with it, we'll um, we'll discover more ways to make it much nicer. So, yeah. so one of the one of the nice effects about this as well is like suppose that I'm uh, depending on a particular component within uh, within NSM, or I'm comp or maybe I'm tracking master of NSM itself. If uh, if if for some reason that the uh, the uh, project fails, like there's an update, it fails in an SM integration test. You know, of course we have to go back and fix it throughout the PRs, but me depend, me as a, uh, as a person who depends on that, on the NSM uh, 
related package don't see a break because that uh, break should be isolated in a uh, in a PR in, in most uh, in, in most scenarios. So uh, so there's there there are some there are some mitigating uh, circumstances. There's areas where it breaks, but because we're because the versions are being uh, uh, locked through the go through the go mod system, you know we're we're not we're not in, implicitly saying always send me the latest. We're saying if you're relying on something, you're saying send me the latest one that is known to pass all tests for that specific component. Uh, so just just as an example, I, you know. Yeah, so basically that, that, that I think gets to be quite good. And, and, and hand in glove with this, by the way, is we're probably going to do a lot more unit testing at the individual repo levels because we would ideally like to minimize how much stuff we catch in integration because we want to catch things earlier rather than later. Um, so this is sort of going to the proposal for where I would suggest we go. And we're actually two part of this already, right? So uh, we have an API repo now. Um, it auto propagates to SDK. Um, and that's for the top level APIs involving network service mesh stuff. Then, right, then we have an SDK repo. Now, when something gets merged into SDK, it should auto propagate to the uh, platform SDKs, right? Things that have platform specific code, because they will depend on it. Um, <clears throat> and then it may also uh, propagate to command repos. And we'll talk about command repos in just a second. Um, and examples of this would include things like, um, you know, sorry, back one. <laughs> examples of you know, the platform repos would be things like SDK VPP agent, um, SDK kernel, SDK SIOV. And those, of course, when something merges there, would auto propagate down to whatever commands are dependent on them, which is not going to necessarily be all of them. Next. Cool. So, and then uh, the idea with the command repos is to have various commands, one per repo. These are the places that would publish Docker containers, initially to a staging uh, Docker registry, uh, so that they could be pulled by things further downstream. But eventually, um, you know, but effectively, that's what's building and in, in putting together the Docker images. And that would auto propagate to things that are more packagers, like Helm or a Helm repo or operator repo. Could you go back one? Uh, and the, the idea would be that these would be for uh, various single things, right? So like the Kubernetes network service manager or a Kubernetes forwarder of some kind would be examples of this. Okay, next. Um, um, yeah, a quick question. Uh, this, uh, I assume that this, uh, the CMDs include also the uh, various unit containers, the prefix service that we have now and everything that's- Yeah, so like NSM there. and that would be an example of a command, a command repo. Um, a proxy and network service manager would be an example of a command repo, that kind of thing. Uh-huh, okay. But it, it has the nice effect that they only end up depending on the things that matter to them, right? So for example, the case, the network service manager command repo, probably doesn't depend on SDK VPP agent, right? So it's not going to get updates from SDK VPP agent. Okay. Hey, Ed, um, another question here. Um, oh, please. Is, is there a place where um, the end state of this repository restructuring is, is, is laid out? Um, as I was going through these slides, I had a hard time teasing that out, which kind of confused me as I was looking um, mm -hmm. at understanding how the pipelining would work. Okay, um, so let, let's dig into that for a second. When you say in state, I was attempting to, not necessarily successfully, mind you, to sort of build out to, towards the in state, which I think we're getting relatively close to, um, which is essentially you, you wind up at a place where you have a repo with your integration tests, and then you have repos for various platform specific things, like I'm going to go execute this on packet, and the actual integration tests run in the integration platform repos. Um, you know, so I'm going to go run this in Kubernetes and package, EK, EKS, AKS, or you know, maybe I'm going to go run this as, you know, K8's um, OpenShift, right, or K8's something else. Um, and that's where we eventually get to the integration testing to figure out whether or not, um, you know, what we've actually gotten has trickled through successfully to fully integrated system. Did that at all answer your question or did I miss your point entirely? Uh yeah, maybe I didn't phrase it right. Uh, that, that was still a useful answer, though. Um. <laughs> <laughs> not all, not all, not all answers that don't answer the question are not helpful, right? You could be right, helpful that, that, and that, not answer the question. Exactly. Uh, no, it was uh, my my question was a little more simplistic. Um, 
as we're breaking apart the Unirepo, mm -hmm. is there um, is there a place where is there anything I can look at um, that uh, would kind of diagram how that Unirepo breaks apart? So you mentioned like these command repos. Now that you've talked about it, um, what I'm seeing here makes sense. Like we have a okay. command repo, and then we have an integration platform repo uh, yep. for for the different uh, platforms. Uh, like what what does the network service mesh project look like um, as far as like the repository breakdown? Uh, that that's the end state. That so like what what, ma what maps out of the what maps to where out of the unit repo is I think part of part of what you're getting at. Yes, it, it, exactly. Um, th that's a more succinct way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that, that's actually a really valuable ask. And I feel slightly silly for not having done something like that. I, I'd be happy to go and do something like that and come back. But it sort of involves sort of picking through the directory structure of the unit repo and mapping that to the kind of repo that it would turn into. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, I, I, th I think that would be helpful. Um, I, and I, I kind of wish I had um, had that context before trying to digest this. Yep. Um, and there's a comment here. Uh, I think you made a comment in the chat, Peter. Do you want to speak up here? Or do you want me to read from the chat? I'm happy either way. Uh, so maybe you can read that. Uh... Okay. So it says the chain is fine for changes like additions in the API repo. But what about changes which are uh, changing method names or parameter types? They'll require an update at least on the SDK level. So anything merged to API will block new additions until SDKs will deal with the update. And I think what you're getting at is if I were to go say change the name of a method in API, I'm going to have to go and quickly fix the downstream. Otherwise, new API changes are going to be blocked waiting for me to fix the thing that I pushed into the downstream. That's exactly what I uh, had in mind. Yeah. And, and I guess the, the the point would be, yes, we're going to have to e either act quickly on that or if somebody if nobody is willing to change the downstream, we may have to back out the particular API change that nobody is willing to fix in the downstream so that we can get ourselves unblocked. Um, but yeah, it's going to require us to actually be somewhat vigilant. Yeah, related somehow I think to this. So today, for example, when we switched to multi-module repos, we had challenges when we wanted to update Kubernetes or let's say, uh, any other, I don't know, uh, the logging frameworks and whatever. So how do you think this is going to work uh, here? Like, I guess that the API is not particularly dependent on Kubernetes, for example, or any piece of Kubernetes, yeah. but... It, it actually makes things in some ways a bit easier because we're trying to keep things more targeted. So for example, um, one of the things with the API is it has relatively few dependencies. I think it basically depends on gRPC and protobuf and maybe a bit of logging stuff. Yeah. The same is true for SDK. The platform specific mm. pieces, you know, if yeah. you look at, you know, the platform specific pieces start bringing in a little bit more. I, I would expect things like Kubernetes dependencies to come into the command repos, quite honestly. Yeah. Um, that's the point at which you're dealing with Kubernetes stuff. So, um, you know, it, it does mean that if say we wanted to bump our Kubernetes version, we'd have to bump it for the appropriate commands. Um, but let me sort of, let me, yeah, that we would have to go, go bump it for the appropriate command pieces um, in the system, yes. Uh, which might be, I don't know, dense at some point. Potentially, yes. Um, I mean, one of the things that, I, I, I'm, that this will do for us is it will let us manage our dependencies a fair bit more tightly. Um, you know, so for example, there are already some things um, in the CI for the existing uh, pipeline repos that will go and check to make sure that certain things haven't crept into the Go mods, right? So for example, you know, if you look at SDK, um, you know, if you look at some of the existing repos, they're making sure that we, for example, don't pull in a dependency on the mono repo because that sort of unwinds everything. Um, you know, that kind of thing. So we, we, we can manage our dependencies tightly here. Um, How about if, uh, for example, I don't know, uh, I think that logging is probably the, 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 the most um, uh, used, uh, like uh, dependency will be used all over uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the projects here, the, the different repos. 
So, um, hypothetical situation. I want to fast forward uh, my CMD, I don't know, uh, Kubernetes uh, networks, NS manager. I want to fast forward it to the next logging version, but uh, I don't want to move my APIs. Uh, do you foresee any problems here? Uh, I mean, only to the degree that you would normally have Go related issues in it. Um, yeah. So one of the things that we actually are doing is <clears throat> we're, there, there's an option when you update Go dependencies um, to update a dependency and its dependencies. So for example, when SDK pushes to the SDK platforms, it pushes an update not only to itself, but to the things that SDK depends on. So for example, if I were to come in and update the version of protobuf that I'm using an API, that would get carried by the API's uh, push to SDK and it would propagate through the system as well. Because it probably is the case that we don't want the common dependencies back tree to go out of sync. I mean, it's messy if something that is, if, if a sibling repo here that you don't have a dependency on comes out of sync but you really don't want to have like 16 versions of protobuf running through the system. Okay. And, and that will automatically resolve itself currently as the, the, the updates get pushed. Okay, one, one more question here. Uh, I think that, that, that all, this whole discussion is uh, really important for us as a community to be aware of what's, what, mm -hmm. what, what is planned and what, how we're going to tackle well, the potential to problems. Figure out, to figure out if we want to actually do this and, and, and to talk through it and, figure out the right way to do it. Because even if we want to do something that is vaguely shaped like this, um, it's not at all clear for me that like exactly as I have presented, this is the right breakdown of all the individual pieces. So uh, my question would be like, so what if, I, uh, what if I wanted to add the example somewhere in this chain? Where do you think that they would fit? And should we consider splitting them in also like CMD but it would be like uh, uh, example dash whatever repos. Uh, but this means that at some point we will end up lowering with <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, repos. It's really, it's really a question of how you like to split up examples. I expect that examples would be something that SDK and possibly various the SDK platforms might push to. Um, you know, so for example, you know, I, I know that many of the examples depend on VPP agent. So it's very probable that examples would be something that gets pushed to by SDK VPP agent. Um, and, and then you could decide if you wanted to break up the examples into separate repos or not. That's sort of yeah. the dealer's choice. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think that we should resolve it now, but it's just like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there are definitely options for that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it, it also, it sort of forces the issue of when some dependency breaks things. Because I know right now, if examples falls out of sync with the mono repo, um, literally that can go on for a while before anybody notices if we aren't vigilant. Whereas yeah, here, yeah. if it depended on SDK, VPP agent, or SDK, or whatever, like you immediately get a PR that shows your breakage. Yeah. The same situation should be with documentation. So it's extension of examples, example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. But should we move forward? Yeah, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about failure detection and remediation uh, because this is sort of a natural question. And we talked a little bit earlier about the case where it's just legitimately, you're going to have to go and clean up the next step in the system, right? So you make a change to the API, you're going to have to clean up the SDK. Um, but this is sort of the case where legitimately you broke something, right? So let's say that somebody, mer a PR is merged into SDK pl platform for some platform. And that propagates down to the various you know, p commands and it ends up propagating through the system and the unit tests at each level are perfectly delighted with the, what's happened. And then you eventually end up propagating to the integration platform pieces and one of those fails, right? So you've got a failure. Sorry for an interruption, but uh, uh, am I correctly reading that, uh, that <clears throat> in Helm you know, we will have uh, some particular tags for images so something new instead of uh, what you have uh, actually is because we have uh, latest almost everywhere and that sucks a bit. Uh, 
so I, we, we, I didn't quite understand. When you said in Helm that you get images which are appointed to the latest uh, in the repository. Mm -hmm. And uh, that leads uh, us to the problem that, uh, for example, test cannot be uh, replicated uh, after some time, uh, run of test because image was updated. Ah, okay. So basically, the idea would be that when we get to actual release images, uh, you would go and, and basically push the release images. But on the Helm charts, effectively with things like Helm charts and, and, and whatnot, you'd want to push a Helm chart for a particular state of the system that's been merged to Helm. Um, exactly. That was my question. Yeah. So you actually should have a version of the Helm chart that you can go point back to that was exactly the version of the Helm chart at that point. Not only Helm chart, but also the um, version of image used to, to uh, test actual PR. Yes, exactly. Right, so you, you will actually be able to say this integration failed, that it failed on this Helm chart, which you can point explicitly to, which contains the explicit Im version of the images that failed. Exactly. Uh, you know, so it, it should make recreation quite a bit easier um, because we actually have a record of exactly what it was that was tested. Um, that you can go refer back to. Isn't it a matter of uh, rebuilding them like locally? Because currently, like we delete all the old images, uh, we used to keep them, but then uh, our Docker Hub accounts became <laughs> like. Oh, we don't less... actually delete them. We put them in a different uh, registry. Okay. Oh. Turns out the deleting images is a massive pain in the ass. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's extremely hard to delete images, and so what we actually ended up doing was we cleaned out our our publishing registries so that they only had the release versions. And then we actually have separate registries that we use for the sort archiving. Of, yeah, basically for, for the image by image builds that we do. Um, the other nice thing here though is right now, and this even on the, the CI repos registries we're using, if a command hasn't actually changed, then we don't rebuild the command. And thus we don't get a new Docker image in this new model. Um, so if, if, if say for the sake of argument that you know, SDK VPP agent settles down and S the uh, command forwarder VPP agent settles down and doesn't change for the next three months, um, we wouldn't rebuild it and we wouldn't have a new image pushed. So, but anyway, you sort of get to the point where you eventually land on the integration testing, you get a failure. So, and this gets back to your point about chasing back what the root of the change was. Um, and we will need to improve that, but you chase back the failure to wherever it, has, wherever it failed on that PR, and you both fix it and you add a unit test to catch that particular breakage um, so that we don't ever you know, bubble through to the integration again. The goal is to progressively, hopefully, never actually break on the integration platforms. Um, it'll take us a while to get there, but that's the goal. Okay. Yep. These are the advantages. Okay. Cool. So, and the advantages, you know, it gives us a clean roadmap to introduce new platforms. So, if someone comes in and says something like, I would like to do a mumble mumble forwarder, the answer is, that's fantastic. We can give you a mumble, an SDK dash mumble mumble and a command forwarder dash mumble mumble repo and, and go play, right? Uh, and and that, that sort of doesn't get directly in the way of things. Uh, it allows for much faster CI experience for users, um, you know, because you go and push things and a minute and a half later, the CI has gone through. Um, it also tends to bias towards test, catching things earlier with unit tests rather than later with integration tests, which I think overall is over time going to be very positive. Um, it also allows for forming of sub communities which I think is very healthy, right? So we've, we've already got sort of like a, a loose grouping of folks who are focusing on the SRIOV stuff, right? So if we wind up with an SDK-SRIOV and a command-forward-SRIOV, you would naturally get sub-communities forming around those. Or for example, we've already got um, some folks who've turned up who've been working on, on an operator for us, and it gives them a natural place to organize themselves around. And I, I think that gets to be quite healthy. Uh, any questions, comments, 
I mean, we've had, I think, a really good discussion around this overall. I think it, this looks super great and I, <laughs> I have been complaining about being monolithic for a while. Like you cannot do a cloud native project and have a monolithic repo, right? You have to go micro. <laughs> it gets painful after a while. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, one, one of the yeah. things that we pitch is uh, build your infrastructure like you build your applications, you know, start moving away from monoliths. And so I'm very happy we have moved away from our own monolith. So um, one of the things as well that we can consider, uh, so we have the operator and we have Helm. Um, and if the, um, if the operator becomes a uh, high quality, uh, it may make sense to have Helm install the operator rather than having Helm install deployments and so on. And that would further simplify the, uh, the path and mm -hmm. even though we would add one more layer. Uh, so just, just something to, to think about because there'll be a lot of people who will install things using Helm and they won't know uh, how to use operators directly. And so I think, um, but I think both of them combined can produce some, some very interesting results. And with that being said, uh, even having an operator and, and even if we get it to help with upgrades and so on, uh, we should still be very careful to design it so that uh, if the operator breaks uh, or does something wrong, that we don't end up in a, uh, we don't end up in a bad spot. And a lot of this is just uh, making sure that the infrastructure itself, that NSM itself, even though it's, it's being helped by the operator, does not rely on the operator for its own success. Yeah, I mean, so, one, one of the things about operators that's both bad and good is operators have the ability to cover for many sins, right? So obviously we, we've done a good job so far of designing network surface mesh to be very resilient. So it's not sensitive to life cycle-ish kinds of things. You don't have to do A and then B and then C in order to have life work out for you. And that's really positive. Um, but an operator, if you have fucked up and made it so A has to happen before B has to happen before C, an operator will, will cover that up for you. And so we do wanna make sure that we don't let our operator get too complicated. Yeah, keep the operator simple and uh, make sure that we bake those into the auto heal stories that are within NSM itself. And so uh, with that, I don't have any other uh, major uh, points to pick out on that. Um, let's see, we have, um, is there anything else we want to talk about on the repo pipelining or should we move on to the uh, last item on the agenda? Cool, let's talk about uh, Google Summer of Code. Nikolai, you have the floor. Yeah, so uh, CNCF is uh, proposing us like being a CNCF sandbox project. So we got the proposals and I, I have just received a reminder that uh, we can submit uh, for uh, Google Summer of Code uh, to the best of what I remember effectively CNCF was doing the sponsorship and uh, it's up to us to provide uh, uh, contact and a kind of uh, mentoring uh, person from on, on our side. So um, I just think I, it was just worth it uh, uh, bringing up to the wider community that there's this possibility and uh, uh, if someone is interested uh, in mentoring more or less, uh, I think uh, it's something that, that we might take advantage of. No, I think this could be super fun and we have lots of little things um, that we could potentially work out as a Google Summer of Code project. Um, do folks want to brainstorm a little and we can keep this as an agenda item for next week and capture some of those ideas for uh, GSOC projects? I just would, would would like to add that in connection with the previous topic, like the the repo pipelining, uh, having Google Summer of Code, uh, someone helping us, would be much easier because you know you form a separate community, as you said, like Mambo Bombo, <laughs> CMD. <laughs> and, uh, I, yeah. I, I I'm 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 quasi infamous inside Cisco for putting slide decks together that are titled Mumble Mumble Architecture, 
Um, <laughs> so. Speak up, you're mumbling. Exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we, my recommendation as well towards this is that we, like the, the new, the way that we're setting up the new repository, we can get some pretty interesting complex, well, things that appear to be complex, uh, but, are, but are still within the grasp of someone who's, uh, who's new in their career. And, and get some high impact things into it. And so it doesn't have to be like, and I'm not saying unit tests are not high impact, but you know, if you come, if you approach it from their perspective, you're gonna come join us and you're gonna write unit tests versus you're gonna come join us and you're gonna write a, uh, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna write a new thing that allows you to connect in with, uh, with PPDK or SRV or, or something else. You know, it's uh, the whole, whole different range of excitement from one versus the other. So, uh, but yeah, definitely. I think we should start a Google Doc on this, and we should uh, we sh we should start to brainstorm ideas towards this, and also uh, um, invite people to be mentors. So it doesn't have to be me, Ed, or Nikolai. If you are an experienced engineer and you want to help mentor someone through some of these things, uh, you don't even have to be a full expert in NSM yourself. Ed, me, Ed, and uh, Nikolai can help with those details. Uh, if you are willing to to help a person who is uh, who is new in their career, so we 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 can also uh, sort of like a, a mentor chain. Yeah, we we can we can help uh, you mentor someone as well. Yeah, no, I, I think this is definitely true, and and in fact, I'd say that the, the broader range of people we have providing mentorship within the community, the stronger we're going to be as a community. Absolutely, and I would uh, and I would love to see. Um, um, uh, more people be able to enter into the position where uh, they can help mentor others as well. So, like, we, it doesn't have to come from from us three. It can, you know, a mentorship can come from from any other area as well, and vice versa. You know, I often look at many of you to to help me work through things as well. And so, but yeah, with that, is there, is there anything else that we want on Google Summer of Code? Cool. And who posted the initialism stuff? Uh, so I, I stuck it in the agenda, but this is something that Peter, have I, am I pronouncing your name correctly, Peter? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Peter Pater. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I try very hard to get people's names right, and I'm really bad at it. So um, it's Piotr. So let's Piotr? Pick it Peter. <laughs> okay, Piotr, I, I, can, I can definitely try and do that. that that's, that's how I would. Uh, that's honestly how I would have made the attempt. It's just very, you know, often I, I make those sorts of attempts and the, the poor person on the other end eventually just says, no, just, just, just use this. Um, so Biotra um, basically had raised a really interesting um, PR on the API repo around initialisms. And this was something I wasn't even aware was a thing, which makes me feel very silly um, in the best possible way. And it's the kind of like get things right, make the API lovely that I really, really like. Um, and this was about a particular set of, uh, do you want to explain a little bit, uh, Piotr, what initialisms are or? Basically it's uh, using uppercase in uh, names for part which is uh, uh, based on acronym. Yeah, so the, the example that the PR hits on is uh, NetNS um, and capitalizing the uh, both the N and the S in, in, in net and S. So, and it's based on uh, code review comments, which is a set of, uh, let's say, good advices to how to code in GoLang. Yeah, and 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 so I I, I kind of like this approach to things, and, and but I'd like to try and get a little bit of consistency around it if we're going to go this route. And I did want to make sure that um, it was something we discussed before we sort of started making these sorts For of changes. For sure, we need to be consistent across the whole project. And NSM in uh, different places of code is uh, differently named. I mean, well, it, with different cases. And do you happen to know, I saw some comments when I was researching this, that they were looking at adding new initialisms, the ability to add custom initialisms to Golint. Um, did that actually, is that a thing? Because 
I, I, I don't actually believe human beings are capable of consistency by themselves at this kind of thing. Um, but I, I do believe in linters. <laughs> <laughs> it would be best uh, if that could be updated automatically, but I think that uh, linters cannot uh, know about all uh, acronyms, uh, especially <laughs> in some specialized uh, projects. Yeah, there, there's definitely a human decision that has to say NSM is network service mesh and is therefore an initialism. That's definitely yeah. a human decision, um, you know, and, and, and things, but, but hopefully once we've made that decision, we can get a linter to keep us consistent. Even simple grep across the project uh, could help. Oh yeah, no. I, 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 if you look at the current CI.yaml, I am not. I am not above the abuse of grep. Uh. <laughs> so uh, I have seen something similar with my VS Code, um, mm -hmm. like suggesting that uh, I should abbreviate it like this or like that. I don't remember. So if something for VS Code exists, I would assume that something for the linter should be possible at least too, but yeah, who knows. So maybe the future step will be to try to find uh, the mechanism for that, which should automatically check uh, PRs against new uh, code with uh, yeah. Introducing some, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. let's say, bugs, okay. semantic cool. bugs. So it sounds like we do want to go this route in general with initialisms. Um, so, um, and, and we want to investigate, you know, basically getting the linters to look after us in that regard. Um, so, I'm, I, is that the con am I hearing that consensus correctly? I'm fully for that. <laughs> Your opinion was never in doubt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent, cool. Yeah, it was it was one of those things where it's very much a, I, I still remember having this conversation uh, at one point in my career with somebody where we were talking about uh, good taste. And part of the problem is that uh, excellent engineers can have differing opinions, both of which are correct when it comes to issues of taste. So I wanted to make sure that we had buy-in before we proceeded with something like this. All right. That's what said. <laughs> so, um, okay, are there any other last announcements before we close up? Okay, well, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and uh, we will see you all again at the same time next week. You all have a good day now. Thank you. See you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs>